I'm excited for today's video conference. My name is Corey and I will be facilitating today's video conference with, of course, our special guest, Mr. Mohammed from the States here who uh, has a wonderful program which I am uh, hoping everyone was able to get acquainted with in our agenda that I emailed out a couple of weeks ago. Before I hand it over to Mohammed, though, I do want to add a few things to what Sanjay uh, had mentioned in order to make this uh, dialogue go as smoothly as possible using this particular medium. As Sanjay said, make sure you mute your microphone when you're not speaking, and then when you do speak, introduce yourself by name. Hi, my name is Corey. Say what you would like to say, and then end by simply saying thank you. That way we'll know that you're done speaking and somebody else can take the microphone. If you remember when your school is done speaking, say that's it from. So that's it from St. Andrews or that's it from Xavier. Again, that way we'll know that your school is done speaking and another school can jump into the conversation without me necessarily having to interrupt the flow of dialogue. You're part of larger groups. But we want to hear from you as an individual. We want to hear from your perspective. So don't feel as if you need to speak on behalf of your class or even your school or city or country. We want to hear from you. So try to remember to use I instead of we. I've observed, I believe, rather than we've observed or we believe. Again, that just reminds us that you're speaking on behalf of yourself as an individual. And finally, we really want to get this in the last half hour to 45 minutes to a place where you're having a true dialogue, a true conversation among one another. So we really want you to be thinking about questions that you want to ask one another as you start to listen to one another speak about this topic of talking back to hate. So think about the questions that you want to ask. Think about good response questions that actually respond to what other people have said. And remember that Part of good listening is, of course, body language. Even if you don't see yourself up on the screen, somebody somewhere can see you. So it's very important to listen respect respectfully, as you're all doing right now. So with all of that being said, let's get started. The way this is going to work is we're going to hear from uh, Muhammad for about five to ten minutes. He's going to give us some background as far as what he does and why he got into his particular field. Then we'll give you some time to ask questions of him, and then we'll have you as students talk amongst yourselves, and at the end of the video conference, Muhammad will come back and reflect on some of the things that he's heard and perhaps challenge you to go out and make a change in this field of talking back to hate. So without further ado, I'll hand it over to our very special guest, Muhammad Ahmed. Thank you. Good morning to some of you. Good evening to some of you. How you all doing today? Well, uh, our stall in Philippines, we say Kumusta Pokayo and uh, Namaste to India. And how you all doing in America, right? Well, my name is Mohammed. I am Average Mohammed. My real name is Mohammed Ahmed. I created Average Mohammed as a moniker. Uh, the question I had was, that I had before I started Average Muhammad is, what can a citizen do? One citizen. What can a citizen do in terms of creating a voice that promotes the values of their society? The three values that I really value, that I do promote with Average Muhammad, is the value of peace, fundamentally, as a Muslim. Because when we do greet each other as Muslims, we say, Assalamu alaikum. That's the international known greeting of Muslims, and that means peace be upon you. And the response is, alaykum as salam, peace be on you. Now, that is a fundamental value of Islam that we're trying to promote. The second value we try to promote is democracy. Philippines, America, India, these are democracies. We have a norm and a social value and a way to govern ourselves, where the people, the individual, the citizen matters. Uh, and the third value we try to promote is anti-extremism. So we started creating Average Muhammad. So what is Average Muhammad? No, seriously, what is it? It's a counter-narrative. Let's start with the word narrative. What's a narrative? A narrative is a story. Now, if you look at the news anywhere in the world, unless you live in a cave, you will hear of ISIS, Al-Qaeda, 
Abu Sayyaf, Alashkar Taiba, you will hear of many, many organizations that believe in violence, political violence, ideologically driven by extreme understanding of their faith. And uh, we decided here in Minnesota, because some of our young kids were joining them, here joining Al-Shabaab in Somalia, or joining Al-Qaeda in, in Yemen or the Arabian Peninsula, or joining ISIS in Syria and Iraq. We decided that the main reason why they're going there is because they're buying into an ideology. Now it takes an idea to defeat an idea. So we decided we're going to take our ideas, the ideas that mainstream Muslims believe in, what majority Muslims believe in, is the values that we started promoting. We started promoting it using our culture, our religion, our democratic principles. Basically, we use whatever tools or resources we had to create a counter-narrative. So what's a narrative? The narrative is a storyline that you get out there as an idea. Everything in this world, from revolutions to concepts to corporate ideas, everything begins as an idea. It starts as a form of communication before it becomes a reality. Our goal is to make counter-radicalization or counter-narrative as mainstream as possible, whether it's the concept of suicide bombing or gender rights, whether it's the concept of beheadings or genocide against other communities, such as the Christians, the Yazidis and the Jews in Iraq and Syria. We speak up. And the values we speak up to is the values of anti-extremism, is the values of democracy, is the values of peace. That's why every video ends with the word peace up, extremists sticking out. Now, there's a reason why we do that. And the reason being, we believe that our kids, given the chance, who are your age mates, at getting a value told to them that explains the opposite of what the extremists are trying to teach, we believe we can stop the recruitment process. We believe we can do it at the point of inception, meaning that before the kid gets access to this information, which is harmful to them, which before they start believing in it, they get to see our message, and hopefully we can be the reason or the ideas that they can have to say, well, okay, Al-Qaeda is saying one thing, ISIS is saying one thing, and this is what mainstream Muslims believe in. And who, who is lying here? Or rather, which better serves me? And the goal is to say, look, we will communicate with you and uh, engage with you and keep on doing it, not one time, but many times, so that that kid becomes a positive peer influence. Let me explain what a positive peer influence is. Right now, each one of you has connections to other kids, has connections to the society, has connection to the community. And if you believe in a value, and you start espousing that value, you are influencing other kids, you're influencing your society, you're influencing your community. That is important. So what can a citizen do? That's the question I started with. A citizen can do a lot in a democracy. You see, in a democracy, we have rights. The right to freedom of speech, the right to freedom to associate, the right to propagate our ideas freely. And that's exactly what we're doing with Average Muhammad. And the goal is to say, look, even though I'm a lonely citizen, I'm not a government official, I don't have a big bank, so I'm a, I'm a, I'm a working man, I, I manage a gas station here in America, I do work for a living, and I do this on the part-time. And the reason why we do this is because the citizen in a democracy has a lot of powers and a lot of rights, and it is a bad thing to waste the First Amendment, the freedom of speech. So we exercise our speech to promote values, which is diversity plurality, gender equity, which means women's rights, and freedom from fear and political violence. Why do we do this? Because violence within our community, everyone loses. If there's violence within our society, we all lose. And that is something that we don't want in our societies. In a democracy, we have means to remedy problems. We have means to negotiate. We vote. We espouse ideas. We try to win as many citizens as we can to our ideas. In a democracy, at least we have a chance. Now, this ideology of extremism is so extreme that that chance does not exist. It is one perpetuated, promoted, and influenced by violence. The only way of communication and persuasion of the other societies is through violence. That tells you that it is a wrong ideology. Now, extremism that I concentrate on is the one of faith. 
And the one that I count on mostly is the one of the Muslim faith. Most Muslims are dying under the extremism. Number one people getting killed is Muslims. Number two is non-Muslims. Now, any death of a human being is a loss to humanity. In the Quran it says, if you save one life, it is equivalent to saving the entire human race. Now, that is saving one life. Now, what happens when people politically violence kill one soul, one life, in a hotel in Mumbai, or in a resort in, Abu, in, 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 in Mundanao, or in, 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 in September 11th in America? That is a loss that we cannot take anymore. So we fight here in the mines because the biggest muscle we have is not this one, but this one. And if we can engage people here, we can engage them in their hearts. And if we can get their hearts, we can get them with their values. We can get them to believe in us, to believe in our system, our system of democracy, to believe in negotiations, to believe in dialogue, to believe to be civilized and to be good. What can a citizen do? A lot. What can you do is the question I'm asking you. And uh, thank you for now. Well, thank you, Mohammed, for that uh, wonderful explanation of what you do and how you came to do that. And I think it's obviously something that a lot of us, especially with our news media, is oftentimes today we feel a little overwhelmed about the world around us oftentimes, and it's the what can I do kind of question. And here we have a, a gentleman that's actually going out and, and, and doing something. And so what I want to do is give you a chance to talk to this uh, gentlemen, uh, about what he does, ask questions about um, anything you're interested in from what you've heard, uh, and we'll take about 30 to 35 minutes for this question and answer period. So what I'm going to actually do right now is give each room about 30 seconds to talk amongst yourselves, and if you could come up with maybe two questions per school for Mohammed. So go ahead and take 30 seconds and chat about a couple of questions that you'd like to ask. Thank you. All right, let's get going here, and we'll just kind of go in a, a couple of different rounds. And so just ask one question this time, and then we'll get through a second round, assuming we have enough time. So let's go ahead and start with Xavier School. Would you like to ask Muhammad a question? Thank you. open all right it's open hello I'm Alec Wong and I just have a question uh, so I'd like to ask if well since your advocacy is about combating one idea with another would you be open to having an open dialogue with ex with groups with members of the extremist group ISIS Should I answer now? Yeah, why don't, you, why don't you go ahead and we'll respond to each question. Well, thank you for the question. Um, that is something governments decide. As an individual, I cannot talk to an extremist organization when my government does not recognize them. As long as they believe in violence, as long as they believe in coercion, as long as they believe in killing. That is something that is a role of governments. As an individual, what we can do is communicate within ourselves, within the citizens. You see, citizen to citizen, me talking to you, and me talking to kids all across this country and around the world through social media, 
and internet mechanisms. And um, we are trying to talk to them, to talk them out of extremism. And the goal that we mostly work on mostly is fighting the idea before formation of the idea. You see, our goal is to reach to kids between the age of 8 and 16, your age group, all across the world, and uh, also in America and all over around the world. And the goal is to go ahead and promote our values so they can buy into our values. Now, if you don't tell them what our values are, then others, the extremists, are doing a good job telling them what their values are and winning them over. And the goal is to go ahead and negotiate with them and talk to them in terms of getting them to see our values. But in terms of talking to extremists, that is something governments do. And I don't think there's any government in the world that wants to talk to anybody who wants to kill them. I don't think anybody in the world would want to talk to somebody who wants them dead. That's just a basic foundation. At least they must accept our right to live and to live freely and our own systems. And that it does not exist right now. So talking to extremists and, 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 and people who believe in violence, that is something our governments have to decide. As an individual, we can talk to the citizens. It is not the extremists I'm after, but the child of that extremist. We want to convince them so they don't go into this generationally. Thank you. All right, thank you. Very good. Let's go over to DPS. Would you like to ask Mohammed a question? Thank you. Am I audible? Hello? Yes, uh, my, yeah, my question was, so you talked about uh, using ideas to combat ideas, to prevent recruitment to uh, ISIS, Al-Qaeda, etc. But that, that's a good idea in the long run. In the short run, isn't violence, not violence per se, but going militarily a more effective strategy for eradicating these threats? For example, ISIS has been flushed out of Libya last week. Russia has joined the campaign in Syria, and these tactics are working. What you're proposing is, more, is a more pacifist approach, which is the right way to go, but realistically, it's a long shot, and it's only good for the long run. So I want to hear your views on that. That was an excellent question. That was an excellent question. Good observation. Yes, there are many ways to fight an ideology. But this has been done before. When, uh, during World War II, today we celebrate it in America, 75 years after the attack of Pearl Harbor. And um, at that time, the enemy was Japan, Germany, and uh, Italy. And there was a war mechanism against them. But then again, supplementing the war mechanism was an ideas mechanism. There was, an, uh, there was a concerted effort by governments to go out and win hearts and minds. Not the hearts and minds of the leaders, in Japan, or, or, or who are imperialists, or the, uh, 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 the, the Nazis in Germany, or, or, or the, the fascists in Italy, Mussolini group, but the citizen, the citizen. You see, you, we found out in 14 years of war in America, we've attacked Afghanistan, Libya, uh, Iraq, Syria, and we have over nine other countries which we're fighting undercover. Uh, now, what we do know is, the killing mechanism goes on, and that's the military way. And the surveillance and law enforcement mechanisms applied by governments to protect their citizens goes on. But without it being supplemented with a counter-ideology, a counter-narrative, guess what happens? They will always recruit. Now, it's a zero-sum game if you keep on killing, and at the end of the day, there will be another recruit taking the place. Now, ours is a long run. We're not taking short term. We're taking long term strategy. We're targeting the kids between 8 and 16 because we're hoping when they turn to 24 and 30, they don't go this route. Does that make sense? And the goal is to go ahead and say, look, we are supplementing the process. There is war mechanism. If someone wants to kill you and wants to destroy your society and is committing genocide in the world, something must be done against them. That is understandable. The whole world has agreed to that. The whole world has agreed to that concept. It is part of the UN Charter to defend lives, to protect lives, and to protect property and, 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 and industry within society. Now, what we do know is as long as we focus 
on just law enforcement and military mechanisms, the, the system fails. Because there was a question asked by Donald Rumsfeld during the Iraq war. Are we creating more enemies than we are killing? And the answer was yes. If you look at September 11th, the problem was only in Afghanistan. Today, over 36 countries have a terrorism problem. So this problem is growing, it's not going down, it's actually expanding. And to say that we are going to use exclusively militarily and law enforcement mechanisms, well, after 14 years and America has spent over $3 trillion, we are where we started. So my approach is the third way. The third way is let's talk, let's dialogue, let's communicate, let's sell our values, and let's see who believes in it, and let's see how many we can get to believe in it. And uh, if they go the different route, well, there are other mechanisms. And uh, law enforcement is something I support. Military, in America here, we value our soldiers. We consider them heroes. But I consider soldiers who fight on behalf of democracies anywhere in the world as heroes because they defend our system. Does that make sense? Yes, it does. Thank you so much. Wonderfully thoughtful question and response. Thank you both. All right, let's send it over to Stonyhurst. Do you have a question for Mohammed? Thank you. So good morning and mabuhay from the Philippines. My name is Martin. And um, Mr. Mohammed, you mentioned that each citizen has freedom of speech, we have a lot of power in this society because we have lots of rights. And you also said earlier that we have to engage basically from our mind to touch the hearts of the society. So in my current standing right now as a student, um, what advice can you give me that would help uh, increase the promotion of law enforcement and to keep the society in check? Thank you. Well, that's a good question. The question he asked is, what can I do as a student to improve my society and my community? And you say, uh, uh, because based on the premises that a citizen can do much. Well, simple. You can start with the most simplest of basic things. You can start with promoting tolerance. Tolerance is a value that basically is taught. Nobody is born tolerant. So when you look at someone who's different in religion, when you look at someone who's different in sexuality, when you look at someone who's different in, in, the, in, 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 in their skin color, and you promote acceptance of them, guess what? Those around you see that, and they emulate that. So promoting tolerance of our diversity. In your country, there is Muslims, Buddhists, and also Catholics, and that's important. But to live together in harmony, you have to accept and tolerate the other. And that is how you do it. So accepting tolerance goes a long way. As a student, that is the most important thing you can do today. When you hear somebody talk bad about Muslims, or Islamophobia as we call it, if you say something, it goes a long way. Because the person saying it believes people believe like them. But when you speak up and you say that is wrong, I know Muslims, and Muslims are not all evil, guess what? You've done a huge step. In other words, what you've done is you've interjected in the conversation and promoted diversity and tolerance. It's the same thing. When I hear anti-Christian talk, I speak up and I say, look, that's not right. The Christians are not believing differently than what you're saying. They know they're not after killing all Muslims. The same thing I say about anti-Semitism. When someone says something about the Jews in front of me, which is negative, I say, look, that is wrong. What you're saying is very hurtful and we don't want to hear it. And those in the room tend to agree with you because let me tell you something. When you speak of good and you promote what is good, you will find other people will come and stand by you. And that is the most important thing you can do as a student is promote tolerance. That is within your power. That is something you can do every day. And guess what? You can influence the students around you and your society. Thank you. Sure, love that idea of if 
I stand up, then shortly thereafter, others will come and stand with me. I think that's, a, that's an important point that Muhammad makes. All right, St. Andrews, would you like to ask a question? Thank you. Hi, my name is Katie, and the question I have is, how do you feel about the rise of hate speech and hate crimes that are taking place in the United States post the presidential election, and what do you think we can do as a community and as individuals to stop the hate speech and hate crimes? Thank you. Well, you're right. Um, hate crimes has skyrocketed after the election. And uh, people who are racist, Islamophobes, homophobes, anti-Semites feel comfortable today to do the hate crime. But I live in America just like you. And in America, we have institutions. Did you know that Department of Homeland Security has a civil rights department? Same thing with the Justice Department. Same thing with the FBI. These people, I've met them. They are aggressive when it comes to attacking people who harm our society, people who commit violence against our community. They are very aggressive about it. They don't, there is, there is zero tolerance in American society on the books by law. If you ever harm somebody, threaten somebody, or even make someone's person's life hell because of their religion, their gender, their sexuality, or their race, this is important. So in America, we have mechanisms to fight and confront this. Again, the effort we have is the people who protect our society from extremists are the same people who protect the same society from Islamophobes and, and, and anti-Semites, homophobes, and racists. And this is important to keep that in perspective. Now, in terms of hate speech, yes, it's real. But this is what we also know in America. In America, our society produced Reverend Martin Luther King, who overcame an obstacle of racism. And that feeling and that teaching of Reverend Martin Luther King is still believed in by overwhelming majority of Americans, including me, a Muslim, who came, who came here 20 years ago. And what he taught us in value is one thing very important. It is we shall overcome. And it doesn't, it doesn't say I shall overcome. It says we shall overcome. It's a Christian song, but it was a momentum and a song for the civil rights movement. Today, we can say the same thing. When these forces of hate raise their hand, raise their voices, we, the forces of love, will raise our voices and we will raise our hand. And there is more of us and less of them. And we will shout them down. And you can do that yourself by communicating in love in peace, in harmony. This is something we believe in, and this is something we can do something about. But in case of how, we have our government to protect us, and our government does a good job protecting our community. Thank you. Good information we're getting here. Please remember that you're going to have quite a bit of time to ask one another questions and converse about these issues. So be thinking as you listen to Muhammad what you might want to bring up in relationship to the other schools as well. But before we do that, I want to give another round of questions here. So let's go back to Xavier. Uh, do you have another question for Muhammad? Thank you. Um, hi, good morning. Um, I'm Jacob from Savior School, and my question is: How has your advocacy affected? How has your advocacy to fighting uh, extremists affected your personal life? Have you ever received any threats, or have you uh, ever have you ever been? Uh, um, is there any positive or negative consequences to to your advocacy? Thank you. Well, you asked two questions. Number one is how has the advocacy been accepted? My community here in Minnesota has embraced me. That's why I get invited to schools, mosques, madrasas, which are Islamic school, which are, for you Christians will be Sunday school, and uh, libraries. I go to synagogues and churches to go and speak with interfaith dialogue, 
whereby I go speak to the Jews and the Christians. And sometimes I even go to atheist organizations. They don't believe in God, but they believe in our community. And this is what we found out. When you speak good, and when you do good, good people rally to you. And they want to hear your message, and they want to spread your message. My community has embraced me because of two things. They have bought into my messages because of two very fundamental basic concepts, which are my tenants. Number one, I speak within my culture. I'm not talking out of my culture. And number two, I speak within my religion. I don't talk beyond my religion. Meaning that I'm a Muslim, and I'm a very proud Muslim. And I'm standing up as a Muslim, an American, a human being. And this is being accepted because, again, I'm speaking... We, there's a difference. Talking at Muslims or talking to Muslims. You see, for 14 years, what we've seen is people talking at Muslims. What we're trying to do here with Average Muhammad is talk to Muslims. We're talking within our values, within our tenets, within our understanding. And these values and tenets stand for anti-extremism. They stand for a democratic principle of governance. They stand for tolerance. And they stand for diversity. That is the true history of Islam. Now regarding threats, the negative part. Of course there will be threats. These people behave people for no reason. So because people like me come out and start speaking and try to deny them recruits, they see us as competition. But more importantly, they know this is competition that can defeat them. More than they fear bombs and bullets. In fact, they don't care about bombs and bullets. These people are willing to sacrifice their lives. They blow themselves up. They blow themselves up. That's an understanding that people have to understand. These people have forfeited their lives. So they're willing to kill for this concept. Now, what I do believe is I believe in this God. This awesome God who protects me. And I live in a country where I also have protections, which is safety. So I am better off. I speak to over 16,000 kids this year. 16,000. With today, I'm speaking to 72 kids right now. And it's going to be 16,072 kids by the end of tonight. And my goal is to do 20,000 before this year is out. I speak to 50,000 kids next year. Now, we also do this on social media, whereby we reach out through Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube. And we've reached over a million people so far in over 130 countries. Now, our message is being received very well. It is working because kids come up to me and they tell me, we're watching those videos and we're seeing your videos, and yours make more sense than the videos of the extremists. Because we are talking to Muslims. That's why we've seen effectiveness. In terms of negative impact, I don't worry about it. I live a, I live a very good life. I live a very peaceful life. And uh, I'm not worried about that. I don't, I, you see, if you believe in values and if you believe in principles, these are things which are worth standing up for. And the day that good people are afraid to speak up because of evil people is the day humanity has lost. And today... We speak up for humanity, and that takes risks, and we're willing to accept those risks as long as we get our message out. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Muhammad. Thank you, Mr. Muhammad. All right, let's send it over to DPS. Thank you. Good morning, my name is Sobit, uh, and my question is, you spoke about the right of freedom of speech. So what I've come to understand and what I've like read about is that freedom of speech under the First Amendment of the United States, it's just written as you have the freedom of speech. But when I read about the freedom of speech in other legal texts, like the Constitution of India, Article 19 has a, cla has a sub clause or a condition which states that freedom of speech unless it causes defamation or any sort of uh, civil unrest. But And uh, Supreme Court rulings of the U.S. have set precedents where uh, Supreme Court rulings have set precedents where, wherein that the freedom of speech, if, even if it is hateful, is fully, under, uh, is fully allowed unless it is an imminent cause to violence. So how do you how do you find that balance between I'm not not as a person but how do you find that balance to combat that uh, people manipulating the first amendment right to say whatever they feel they want? That is a very good question. <laughs> I'm going to try to answer it as best as I can. Uh, 
I'm not familiar with Indian clauses of law about the Article 19, but here in America, the Supreme Court was asked, can a person shout fire in a crowded theater when there's no fire? And, uh, and the Supreme Court said, even though there's freedom of speech, you cannot shout fire in a crowded theater to scare people and harm people. Now, protection exists within freedom of speech. In America, it says, Congress shall not abate or, or limit any kind of freedom of speech. That's why we have organizations like the Ku Klux Klan, the white nationalists, the Nazi party, allowed to exist and pro promote their concepts and their values. People like Westboro Baptist, Westboro Baptist Church, which basically does a lot of harm in terms of the rhetoric. Now, this is accepted. You see, we are so free in America that we believe that even hate speech has a right to speak because we believe good speech will overcome that hate speech. And the main reason why we believe in that is because we don't want it to go underground. Anything that goes underground becomes more problematic. More problematic. We want this out in the open. So when the neo-Nazi speaks, like the one who does that, there will, there will be 200 people to come listen to them. But trust me, in America, there will be a thousand people outside protesting them. Because they are exercising their freedom of speech. Now, we do understand freedom of speech in America. You see, in America, freedom is valued above all else. Freedom of the individual is valued above all else. That's why the individual is told you can speak to whatever you want to believe in, as long as you do no harm. Now, is there harm coming from hate speech? Yes. Now, how do we stop it? By people like me and you. That's how we stop it. When they come out in the open and they do a rally, we stand silently on the side and we say, we don't believe in what you believe in. And our city leaders come up and they say, we don't believe in what you believe in. And our governors come out and they say, we don't believe in what you believe in. And our head of state comes up and they say, we don't believe in what you believe in. And the American people, majority of them stand up and say, we don't believe in what you believe in. This is important. Our hate speech is out in the open. We don't hide it. In India, there are other issues and other concerns. I can't speak to India because I don't know much about India clauses. But I do understand that that's defamation is something that is acceptable unless you're a public figure. If you're a private person and someone defames your name, you can legally sue them here in America to protect your name, your honor, and your reputation. This is something that's acceptable in America. It's called libel laws. We have it called, it's called libel laws. And we have that in America as a protection for citizens. But if you're a public figure, everything is acceptable. Whether people talk bad about you, make fun of you, or praise you, it doesn't matter. It is all covered under freedom of speech. Does that help answer your question? Or would you want me to elaborate more? No, I understood it very much. Thank you. An excellent question to be sure, especially when considering the two different legal systems and, and cultural norms. Thank you very much for that question. Okay, let's send it over to Stonyhurst. Thank you. Um, hello, sir. Good morning from the Philippines. My name is Aitana. Um, you said a while ago that us people, we have a voice. We have a lot of power. Then how come there are those who have to die to be heard and there are those who still have to fight for their rights? Thank you. Can you please repeat the question? Can you please repeat the question? Um, sir, you said a while ago that as people we have a voice, we have a lot of power. Then how come there are those who still have to die to be heard and there are those who still have to fight for their rights? Thank you. That's a good question. How come other voices are not heard? How come other voices have to fight for their rights? You have to understand, even this idea of democracy comes about because people fought for it. In a democracy, there's always going to be a pull and a push. There'll be people pulling for one idea and people pushing against that idea. Now, with the pull and push, it comes up to numbers. Who can convince their neighbor, their co-workers, their fellow citizens into their concept and their ideas? Who can do it peacefully and intelligently? Now, and the other question is, how do you go about doing it? Now, if you act in a civil tone, that is the best way to go about it. If you act and talk with tolerance, that's the best way to go about it. If you sit down and listen 
more than you talk. Listen to the other side and try to understand where they're coming from. That helps a lot. It goes a long way. So active listening is part of the solution. How do people who are indigenous, people who are minorities, people who are voiceless have a voice? You organize yourself. Organize people of goodwill. Organize yourself as a student body. Organize yourself as a citizen body. Organize yourself along with your goals and your objectives. And don't have a hundred goals. Have maybe five goals and try to achieve three. And you have success. Everything takes long time. Nothing worthwhile ever happens overnight. Now understand this. In democracy, I'll give an example of my democracy in America. People started here about 200 years ago owning slaves. 150 years ago under Jim Crow laws which separated the races. And 60 years ago, there was a civil rights movement. 2008, we elected a black man as a president. Now that took effort. It took time. It took riots. It took litigations. It took going to court. It took people dying and it took people standing up. It took organizations and people coming together for us to get there. Understand this. There's nobody who today is dispossessed in a democracy who will forever be dispossessed as long as they engage in the system. Those that engage outside the system, who use violence to counter and push their ideas, now these are people all of us must stand against. Because at the end of the day, once you input and inject violence into the conversation, everyone goes to one end or the other. And people lose. Society loses, community loses, humanity loses. Now that is what we are against. That is what exactly what Avish Mohammed is trying to promote against. And that's the value that we try to promote. But for the voiceless to have a voice, quite simple. Organize yourselves, prepare your talking points, and go at it. Whether you have to sit in, demonstrate, or you have to communicate with media, or you have to negotiate. At the end of the day, you'll get a seat at the table. That is only true democracy. No other system can brag about that. Thank you. All right, let's wrap up the questioning one more time with from St. Andrews. Thank you. Hi, my name is Kira, and being a Muslim, I wanted to know how seeing other Muslims being treated harshly by others makes you feel. Thank you. Look, I will not sit here and tell you Islamophobia is not real. Um, my cousin got verbally assaulted for wearing the hijab. Our women cover their heads. And this has become an issue now. And uh, all of a sudden people feel like taking the robe off their head by force or telling them get out of the country. Go back to where you came from. This is our country. This is our home. You see, America is my home. And we do have Islamophobia that's becoming a problem. But this is what we do know. If we back down, if we don't organize ourselves, now nothing else will change. Here in Minnesota, we have interfaith alliances where people from all faiths, the leaders, the clergy, they sit down and they talk. And more importantly, when someone is harmed because they're Muslims or threatened, like our mosque being threatened to be blown up, they stand up together. And they talk to the community in a press conference and they say, we don't believe in this. That goes a long way. And not only do the, the clergy people, but my government stands with them. The Sheriff's Department, the FBI, the Justice Department, the Department of Homeland Security. They stand all of us together and we say, we don't believe in this. Now, what we do know is there's a few elements who are harming our society. But then again, for us to overcome, it will take all of us. It will take me, you, and the people in these rooms to come together and say, no, we will never accept that. We won't accept that. We will never take that. That is something we will never accept. And that is something we will fight and we will talk about and we will continue advocating and educating people about so that the next generation does not follow that path. Now, Islamophobia is real, just like racism is real. Just like people who are from different ethnic minorities being discriminated on, especially the smaller minorities. But what we do know is this. In our society, we have a system to combat it. It has been shown to work. It has been shown to be effective, and we use those means too. We use media, we use public talking, we use talking in interfaith dialogue. That's why I go to churches and synagogues and any other organization that invites me to speak to them. Because at the end of the day, the more we spread this message of love, of peace, 
of understanding, the more better off we are, of tolerance, of diversity, of plurality, of understanding. This is how we fight and we change minds and we change hearts. And we do it by talking, dialogue. It starts that way. And if, it, if push comes to shove, we can always take Islamophobes to court. And the justice system can take care of them if they're violent. So I'm not worried about it. It is a concern, but overwhelming majority of people are decent and good. And they want good in society. And that is what I've hoping. And that is why Avrit Mohammed knows that I will find success in my society and in the world. Well, loads of information that we've gotten here in the last 45 minutes. Thank you so much, Muhammad. So for now, about the next 30 minutes, we're going to let Muhammad rest and listen to you as you converse now for a little bit. And so what I'd like to do, since we have been exposed to all this wonderful information, these thoughts, what I'd like you to do, I'm going to give the rooms a, a minute again and uh, talk with in your rooms, what would you like to ask other schools? What points would you start to like to, to discuss? And really what we're looking for here is a discussion about where uh, you stand up to hate. Have you um, stood up to hate in your own schools? Do you have examples of where you stand up to when you've stood up to hate? What inspires you to stand up to hate? And how can we practically do this? How can we do this as individuals and as communities? What are the kinds of things that we can do that are practical and realistic? So go ahead and take a minute, talk amongst yourselves within your group, and then I'll ask uh, schools to ask one another questions. Thank you. Okay, let's go ahead and get the conversation started among the four schools. Now, this might be a little awkward at first, but um, we'll settle in. It always works out well in these video conferences. I'm just going to open it up to anyone who would like to ask a question. So any of the schools can jump up. You can ask your question specifically for uh, another school or just throw it out for all three other schools to answer. So whoever would like to get the microphone first, go right ahead. Thank you. Hi, so I have a question which is open to all schools. Uh, the most common form of venting or, you know, fighting a movement for our age is through social media. So my question is, how do you guys, you know, there's something called a liberal bubble or a conservative bubble. So I'm assuming most of us are in a liberal bubble here. So how do you work towards getting out of that liberal bubble and getting your message across to far-right conservatives who believe that certain people are not equal to, let's say, white people or, or other, any other sort of extremism? How do you get out of that bubble to reach them through social media? Because the way social media works is that if I start like, liking liberal things on Facebook, Facebook is going to continue, show me liberal, continue to show me liberal things. It's not going to show me Fox News. So how do you guys work towards... How do you guys work towards getting out of that bubble? Okay. 
Uh, hi, my name is Jody, and I personally am a part of uh, many social media groups. However, I try to expand, like, not just liking one, like, as you said, like, um, liberal or non-liberal. I try to expand and, like, look at all of it to get a bigger perspective. And one of the things I encountered was a Muslim man, a Muslim American man, and he was, he had a sign that said, I am Muslim and I am, and I am like hated on in America. However, I am one of the better ones. So if you trust me, give me a hug. And there was a lot of like Americans who saw this man and most of them were like, went up to give him a hug. And a lot of these were children. So back to what Mohammed said earlier is how trying to reach the younger kids. I think that's something that, you know, social media will actually allow people to do. However, I feel like as young adults, we should be more open to even though you may come from like a liberal background, you should, even though it might be very awkward and kind of not in your comfort zone, you should try to take that one step to try to broaden your perspective and look at what other people have to say. Even though it's not all probably what you agree with, it's at least you've tried. Thank you. Would Xavier or Stonyhurst like to respond to that excellent question concerning social media? This is a very important topic when it comes to hate speech, to be sure. Thank you. Uh, hello, sir. I'm... Vito Malabanan. Um, I think that most conservatives, I mean, I believe we can share our li liberal mindsets with conservative people by simply working with them or be trying to be friends with them. If we work, share, uh, towards share our work and work towards common goals, I think we can see beyond our viewpoints. You'll see people as, as us. We'll see them beyond their politics. We'll see them as regular human beings. I feel like if we accept them as like that, we might be able to share our viewpoints more. Thank you. I do think, too, I'll, I'll just interject um, real quick here as we've kind of made that assumption that we're all in the, the liberal bubble, and maybe that's true here, but we don't always know who's sitting around us. And, for instance, in my own classroom in a school that I teach at, um, we had a couple of students in our particular Generation Global group who um, were very conservative and actually liked our president-elect, uh, and he or both of them were very quiet because they were worried about um, talking. But once they were part of a group and we weren't worried about politics as much and people were able to accept them as other human beings, then when they did voice their opinion, it was uh, a better conversation. So the, the gentleman there at Stonyhurst makes a very good point about accepting others um, and then trying to reach out to people that might have other political views and certainly uh, if there are anybody or if there is anybody on today's video conference that it comes from more of that conservative bubble I hope you feel free to to talk about that from that perspective as well Xavier do you have any responses to that question concerning social media thank you all right so my name is Alec Wang so from my personal experience, I see Facebook as, I see social media as something tailored to the individual. So the problem with erasing that bubble of, between liberals and conservatives on social media is the, fact that, no, is the fact that no matter what, social media is tailored to the person. So if you already have these conservative inclinations or liberal inclinations, that's all you're going to see. And for me, the problem of 
invading that bubble is that you're not supposed to. That's not what social media is. Social media, as much as we call it a social media, is actually one of the most in the individualistic or egotistic things that's available to our generation. In my personal experience, the best way to change someone's perspectives is to actually go out and do it, actually see the world, actually talk to people. You know, uh, as much as the medium, as much as the medium of communication has become ever so convenient for us because of technology, I believe it became it allows us it uh, it has allowed us to become a bit lax, a bit uh, disconnected with the, with other people. So, in my perspective, the best way is to go back to old-fashioned physical communication reaching out to people and that's the only way to kind of pop those bubbles that we've formed around us because well ignorant well people who well because of the overwhelming presence of social media we're allowed to see more often than before how many people support one side how many people support the other side so if such a clear majority is seen it's actually harder for minorities to have a voice because of social media because they see it as a more daunting challenge than ever before because the number of individuals that they see us against them is larger than ever before. So that's kind of the downside of having social media in that you see how many people you're actually going up against when you voice out your opinion. So I believe having self-confidence and actually just going out there is the best way to combat hate speech, ignorance, all that stuff and breaking the bubble so that we would have a more successful dialogue. Thank you very much. Very nice insight there, Alec. All right. Any other questions from other schools? We've heard from DPS. Would any of the other three schools like to ask a question? Thank you. Um, good day. I'm Ariel. And in the Philippines, an anti-bullying law has been passed up. And I, as a student, I engage in activities such as making posters about anti-bullying. So in, in your schools, this is for all the schools, how do you promote anti-bullying? Thank you. Hi, my name is Ambikeshwar, and uh, answering your question about how to tackle all the, the problems that you brought up, um, a bunch of my friends and I, we made this organization called Teen Line India, where anybody, any teenager facing any issues regarding school, home, bullying, racism could give us a call at any time, and it would be anonymous. That person would not have to share their name would not have to share where they come from with school or anything. We would anonymously help them solve their problems. So such organizations, if created in, for example, your country and the other countries that are present here, we would be able to help different people with problems. And I think that answers your question, I hope. Thank you. Xavier or St. Andrews, would either of you like to respond to that question concerning uh, anti-bullying type of campaigns or anything that you've done to promote anti-bullying? Thank you. Well, then let me rephrase the question so we can hear from Xavier and St. Andrews. Beyond anti-bullying, what other kinds of campaigns have, has your school been involved in, if any, um, concerning hate speech in general? Have you done anything either as a larger school or as a group within your school in order to combat hate speech uh, of any kind? Thank you.
Oh, wait, there's still a few. Oh. Hi, I'm Joseph from Saver School. And um, here we have committees uh, designed, well, not really designed, but it is something that we tackle and uh, discuss as well. Um, so we have uh, committees like the Gentlemanless Committee or uh, others that have different programs and these are all school-led, um, uh, I mean student-led um, organizations and committees and it allows us to think of ways to solve our own problems. So yes, thank you. And sorry, can you come back up Joseph for just a second? Sorry. Hello. Do, you, do you have any examples of what kinds of problems you're talking about? Thank you. Well, I guess something um, something prominent, or not really prominent, but something that we could uh, observe would be um, the use of uh, profane language, I guess. And um, something that we did uh, about that is we made uh, cutouts uh, with uh, role models of uh, our students here. And uh, what it says is uh, obviously it promotes uh, the, the, the lessen the use of um, cursing and other things like that. So it's something friendly, but it's something that gets the message across to others. Thank you. And it looks like St. Andrews has somebody there. Would you like to respond? Thank you. Oh, okay. Hi, my name is Felisa from St. Andrews. And um, just this year, we created a new class called Global Girls, and it educates students about uh, global issues and um, currently we're doing projects on certain topics that we've picked and a lot of them relate to uh, human rights um, like LGBTQ rights and um, human trafficking. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, and we've heard from two of our schools. Would either St. Andrews or Xavier like to ask a question of the other schools? Thank you. Hi, my name is Catherine, and this is a question for all the other schools. So right now in the United States, we just had our election, and I would like to know what your views are on how America is going to be run and how that's going to affect the world and your views. Thank you. And one thing to keep in mind here always with when we start getting into politics is just remember that we want to hear from you as an individual, number one. And number two, remember too that you're uh, spe not speaking on behalf of political organizations with this particular medium. I would suggest you go the route of how have you perceived the election in the United States and um, what are some possible concerns that you have or um, hopes that you have for the recent election. Looks like we have uh, somebody at DPS. Go right ahead. Thank you. Uh, all right. So I followed the US elections very closely. Uh, and Trump won. So I think it's a very familiar example that you've asked us because all of us will be aware with it. So uh, according to me, Trump's campaign was one of instilling fear into people. Right. Now, 
I want to ask, it's a rhetorical question, not really, I, I want to know your thoughts on this, that is there a difference between speeches where you try to instill fear and when you try to spread hate? Are they the same thing or are they two different things? Number two, when, 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 you, when you're a nationalist group and you're in a multi-ethnic, multi-racial country, if you glorify nationalism or if you want to, uh, say, uh, make a certain class feel inferior, or basically when you glorify nationalism and not demean any other political group per se, it is automatically implied that you're against those groups, right? So Trump was all big talk, and he is a businessman. He's the product of capitalism. But I don't think that his bold policies will actually be implemented because, well, America is a democratic institution. Uh, he'll need support in the Congress. He'll need support in the Senate. And personally, the Republican Party, from what I know, is not quite sold on the idea of Trump. It was his money that got him the nomination election, let's be honest. And I don't think that Trump has the power in a democracy as strong as the United States of America, which is which sets an example for every other country to just win the election and build up a wall. So it'll be exciting if that actually happens, but I don't think it'll personally happen because democratic forces and the people will prevent that, and that's what the idea for democracy is all about. Uh, people are already protesting, it's happening, people want Hillary back, they're finding ways that she can come to power. Trump, on the other hand, it'll be exciting to see what he does but I don't think that with the democratic means and procedures that you need, uh, I, I don't think that presidential directives and such can also overcome his, can also help implement his big, bold strategies. I think it's a farce, and his victory, for, personally for me, it represents a victory for the conservatives, it represents a victory for those nationalistic elements uh, because America was filled with immigrant crises and that's now spreading to European nations as well with the Syrian refugee crisis and I think that it's a very scary step but probably the democratic institutions can prevent anything wrong from happening. That's what I feel. Thank you. I will go ahead and send it over to to Xavier here in just a second, but I think that last point is is a crucial one, and I think it's something that Mohammed has been talking quite a bit about as well in his remarks as far as the power of democracy. Um, some people see uh, Mr. Trump's campaign as one that was filled with hate speech or or uh, relied on hate speech of of sorts, and um, it, it's a question of whether or not that hate speech will transfer into government policy. So uh, remember to kind of keep that framework in mind as far as when you're talking about the election. Uh, remember that we're talking too about this specific to topic of hateful speech or hurtful speech. So uh, can consider that in your remarks. So Xavier School, go right ahead. Thank you. Hi, I am Sean. And if there is something I think Trump's presidency will achieve is that it would make the United States more divided than it is united. Because how do you expect to solve a problem by having someone who is a misogynist and a racist as your leader to represent your nation, to lead your nation into doing things. Like, the way I see it is that Trump is trying to fight something wrong with by doing something that's also wrong. And as we know, two wrongs won't make a right. Like, as of now in the Philippines, our president is President Duterte, and he has this war on drugs. I mean, of course, it's something we all want to fight. We all want to fight drug abuse, drug addicts, those who are pushing these drugs into our nation, but the way he's doing it is by actually killing the people who are pushing drugs and and the addicts instead of offering them help. And just recently, they have passed the death penalty law, if I'm not mistaken. And I feel that when you are trying to fight something wrong by doing something wrong, then that won't make it any much any less wrong it would make it more wrong if anything like um relating it to the hate speech one i believe that when fighting hate speeches and like when being hated on the answer is not to hate back or to use violence to answer but to find more peaceful and 
and more loving ways in order to combat these instead of just being irrational and impulsive and going for the aggressive wrong thing to do. So thank you. Stonyhurst, any of your students would like to, would, would any of your students like to respond to that question? Thank you. Okay. Hi, I'm Daniel Hernandez of Hawaii. So, with the recent elections that happened in the United States, I was actually really surprised that Trump won. Because um, in the news lately, um, we have seen that Donald Trump has made comments about building a wall in the south southern border in Mexico, and also his plan of trying to make America one, one white nation and he's trying to um, put other races to their own country so when he, when he won it was really a surprise instead of Hillary winning so for me um, it would also be uh, a challenge for Donald Trump to to deal with all those ethnic groups that um, live within the within American side and how he would pursue pursue his pursue the demo, democratic way of America, and uh, it would also be um, a challenge for him to overcome as time goes by. Thank you. Definitely a very important and prominent topic in our world today, to be sure. That leaves us with Xavier. Xavier School, do you have a question for your partner schools? Thank you. Okay. Hi, I'm Nico Ang, and I'd like to ask, um, uh, how is our new President Rodrigo uh, and his speeches and actions perceived by your country, uh, in your countries and by your community? Thank you. Uh, can I answer? All right, so uh, your President Rodrigo Duterte, uh, he's been on the news quite a few, but because recently, just yesterday, I saw just just yesterday I saw this video of him impersonating Hitler and talking about persecuting the Jew problem. Uh, sorry, not not the Jew problem. Apologies for persecuting the drug problem, for ending the drug problem in a way symbolic to the Hitler's persecution of the Jews, and. I mean, I'm all for ending the drug problem in Southeast Asia. I know Philippines is greatly affected by it. But Duterte's way, I think it's iconic. Because, because uh, you can't just kill everybody, kill everyone who's related to drugs, kill everyone who's taking drugs, kill everyone who's supplying drugs. That's something that the CIA tried to do in Latin America. It did not work for them at all. Uh, we are very familiar with how hard the CIA and the DEA. Just one thing. Just one thing. There's an announcement going on. We're all familiar with the way the CIA and the DEA and the Colombian police forces tried to capture Pablo Escobar. That war was probably the most costliest and most deadliest, one of the most deadliest wars in the history. And what Duterte is doing is the same thing in a much more unprecedented scale. I do not know his, I'm not aware of his other policies, his domestic policies. I'm just aware of what comes in international news in India and that's that uh, Duterte is this strong man who wants to end the drug problem but his methods and policies are extremely controversial and uh, 
I mean, I, I, I'm unaware of the public opinion in Philippines. I want to know what you guys think about him as well, because that will give more of an indication as to whether he's doing is the correct thing or not. Thank you. St. Andrews, would anyone like to respond from your school? Have you heard much about the Philippines president? Thank you. Hi, I'm Felisa, and um, I've also heard most, um, basically everything that um, was just said. Um, but I'm like uh, being Filipino. Um, it also directly affects my family in the Philippines, and um, most news I've heard from them um, also through just watching the news and yeah I've heard um, the same things Um, so as a small, oh, okay. my name is Anjali, and as a small community that we are, we're actually really isolated from like the mainstream media most of the time. So a lot of us actually haven't heard about any of this unless we really follow the news. And oftentimes, like young adults or teenagers such as ourselves, we don't tend to follow that. But I think we should really try to do that so we have a chance to know what's going on on a global scale and so we can dialogue furthermore and just know what's going on. Thank you. You know, I like that last comment because as we ta start talking again about these big ideas and the big political scheme, it kind of come back, comes back to what can we do, what do we need to do. So if you feel like you're kind of isolated, don't hear much of the media, uh, how important it is to go out and seek this information, especially with these leaders that are associated with hate speech. Uh, and that takes us to Stonyhurst. If we could go back to the Philippines and see what you have to say as far as your part in the Philippines. Thank you. So good morning, I'm Jackie Mumuhai. As a Filipino, I truly believe that the people saw the person's purpose and it is our duty to embrace the changes he would actually implement here in the Philippines. In terms of his advocacy to end the job, I truly believe that it is already our duty to commit ourselves and advocate with him to stop drugs. And as what he said before that he is actually, that is his first priority here in the Philippines. And for us to achieve this advocacy on drugs, I believe that as students, we as well can involve ourselves in such service wherein we could promote peace here in the Philippines. Thank you. An excellent job bringing it back again to what you as an individual can do or what you foresee students doing in order to stand up to some of the wrongdoings that you might perceive uh, government officials or other people uh, enacting. Okay, what I'd like to do now is send it over to Mohammed for his reflections on what he's heard you discussing here over the last 30 minutes or so. And then at the very end of the video conference, we'll go around and get some reflections from each of the schools. So Mohammed, would you like to uh, reflect? And if you have anything to offer as far as challenges for the students, feel free to do so as well. Thank you. Well, you raised a lot of questions. And uh, I'm, I'm fascinated. And I'm actually impressed. Because you guys seem to know a lot. <laughs> and that's a good thing. That means you're engaged. Being engaged is the first, the first battle. Let's talk about social media, regarding venting on social media. I'm going to give you a warning. 
your generation social media. Governments look at your post now. Corporations look at your post before they hire you now. So watch what you say and how you say it. More importantly, like I said, you have to be polite, you have to be civilized. If you're polite and civilized, you can always learn. Now, social media is a great equalizer. Let me tell you why it's a great equalizer. That's why me, Mohammed in Minnesota can be in 130 countries. That's why today Average Mohammed is talking to you kids because of social media. Because I've facilitated a new social media to reach out. So social media can be a tool for good. Don't limit yourself to understandings and values that make you only comfortable. Try to see other values and other understanding. Like I say, learning and being tolerant is active listening. Listen to others. Read what others are thinking. And then you understand where they're coming from. The second question we had was about conservatives. Well, uh, conservatives are no better than liberals. They have values. And their values basically is the same as liberals when it comes to core tenants. It is the mechanisms that they may disagree with each other. But the core tenants, here in America, the principles of those tenants is liberty, freedom, and justice. And uh, it doesn't matter whether you're a conservative or a liberal, or uh, no, none of them. Uh, we do believe in certain basic tenets of liberty, freedom, and justice. And that is the binding factor. You see, you have a lot in common that we do have in differences. Differences can always be hashed out through policy and votes, elections. Uh, the third question. You see, I believe in love of humanity because I believe in humanity. I believe that there's more good in this world than there is evil. And if you promote good, good will come. As a Muslim, we are told, promote good and forbid evil. And that's what the purpose of Average Muhammad is, to promote what is good within our society and, pro and, and, and forbid what is evil. And uh, promote concepts of polarity, diversity, concepts of understanding and tolerance, concepts of democracy and peace, concepts of anti-extremism. This is very important to me because my community is directly being affected by it, and my society and my country and my humanity is being affected by it, and we can do something about it. Uh, the other part, regarding President-elect Trump. In America, we only get one president. I think you get one president in India, Narendra Modi. I think you get one president in, in, in Philippines, Rodrigo uh, Duterte. Now, what we can do as a people is, first of all, wish him well, and pray for them, and hope that they end up doing good. It is not all doom and gloom when you see things. The media tends to sensationalize things. So take it with a grain of salt, what they say about other people. But do understand that electorally, these people were elected to be your leaders. They deserve the right to rule and govern. And we will accept their rule and govern as long as we have the right to our own ways and means to accept them or reject them. Now that is a fundamental understanding of democracy. That is what democracy is about. It's about majority rule, minority respect. Now, for Donald Trump, I think internationally, people are looking at him as a misogynist, a racist, and a person who hates uh, other people and other communities. But to the, to the guy in Michigan who was a factory worker who voted for him, that's not what he saw him as. He saw him as an economic savior. To someone in, in Kentucky who is a coal miner who has been unemployed now, for two years or three years, they're looking at a way out, and they saw hope in him. So we have to respect that. We have to ultimately respect that. And more importantly, the guy hasn't governed yet, so we'll see how he governs, and uh, we'll give him a chance until then. And um, what we can say is, we get only one president, and we wish that president all the good luck in the world. That's, the, that's what we do here in America. We wish him good luck, because we want good to come out of them. So that me, as an American, you, as an international resident, can get the benefits of his rule. And uh, regarding the drugs and the drug war in Philippines, the whole world is watching and the whole world doesn't understand it. But what we do know here in America is we have a drug problem. And uh, in my community today in Minnesota, we have a, a huge heroin problem. I work in a gas station and uh, in an inner city and I see these heroin addicts every day, every day. And these are good people. These are decent people. They just have a habit. And some of them are forced because of this habit to do wrong and break laws. What I do understand is, what I've come to my understanding is, if there's a demand, there will always be a supply. If there's addicts, there will always be a supply, especially if the profit is a thousand percent. 
If a person can make a thousand percent profit on a commodity that costs one penny and sell it for a, a, a for sell it for a, a, a dollar or a hundred dollars, they will always be selling it. So what we do understand, what we do believe in as a community, we're coming around is treatment. In my Congress, this particular budget, they're passing five hundred million dollars to do just treatment, treatment to treat addicts. Because if we destroy the demand, the suppliers will lose market, and if they lose market, they disappear. So that's what I do know as a, as a, as, a, as a personal opinion because I'm allowed to give a personal opinion, and uh, these are the things that you guys have discussed, and I'm very impressed. That means you're engaged. Now my challenge to you is this: What are you going to do in terms of promoting tolerance, in terms of promoting diversity, in terms of pro promoting civility and politeness within society, in terms of accepting other people's political opinions? Because it's important for us to make a society. We have to listen and we have to engage and we have to respect. Can you take that value and challenge yourself and say, "Look, I will commit myself to diversity. I will commit myself to plurality. I will commit myself to my democracy, and I'll commit myself to civility and politeness. And I will commit myself to promoting that which is good, which we have a common value in and common agreement in. What will you do beyond the programs you worked on?" Other programs, maybe school programs, maybe activities, maybe something along those lines. I'd be interested to hear what your opinions are. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Mohammed. Some uh, excellent challenge and some excellent reflections on the questions that were brought up amongst the students. Well, everyone, we only have about four minutes left. So what I'd like to do is go to each of the four schools if we could get one person from each school to reflect on what you'll take away from today's video conference. Uh, if you were to go home, somebody was going to say, hey, what did you get from the video conference? What did you learn? What will your response be? So go ahead and take like 30 seconds, talk about it, and then we'll go around uh, each school, but just one student for the sake of time. Thank you. Okay, we've lost Stonyhurst, so we just have the three schools. So I'll go ahead and invite DPS to start us off. Thank you. Hi, I'm. Uh, yeah. Hi, I'm Tanu Jain, and uh, I just like to share my views as to what I learned today. So uh, today, what happened is that since we all got together, I learned that everyone here is actually fighting for the same noble cause. Everyone here knows that hate speech is bad and that we need to take actions against it. Now, the thing is, we discussed today about Donald Trump. We discussed about how, how, how like, situations in different countries, Philippines, United States, India, we discussed laws. Now, the thing is, uh, what I thought of it was, even legal implications can actually take care of a lot of situations that are happening in countries. So, uh, leg uh, legally, we can tackle a lot of things like, uh, like Sir said, Mohammed Sir said that uh, there can be laws posed against, like if you deal with supply, uh, like when you're dealing with a drug problem, what happens is in the United States, if you uh, deal with the supply, if you deal with the demand problem, you can directly uh, eliminate supply because if you take away demand for drugs, then you can directly eliminate supply. So there is no prospects for any drug problems once you deal with the demand. Now the thing with hate speech is. Here in India, we uh, deal with a lot of, uh, uh, we, we, we have a lot of, uh, um, a, yeah, a, a wave of uh, intolerance. Thank you. <laughs> we have a wave of intolerance. However, gradually what happened is that we learned about it. There was a social uprising. We had uh, 
petitions online we had videos made uh, by a lot of uh, youtube channels and that that actually gained a lot of confidence from people a lot of movements came up and we actually fought against intolerance and i think that's what is needed in a lot of countries today so that we can come together as a community and fight this noble cause thank you thank you very much st andrews can we hear from you thank you Hi, my name is Madison, and what I took from today video conference is that social media is a good way to like connect with other people, but it also it also decreased our abilities to connect with others face to face because I've had some experiences with people and I've seen other things happen where people are talking online but when they meet in person it's kind of hard for them to connect because they've never had like this connection in person and I also learned that we have many similarities in the way in what we think about hate speech and what we can do about it and yeah thank you good thank you very much and that leaves us with our friends at xavier thank you Okay, so uh, hi, I'm Aaron. So uh, I think what we can take away from, what I personally can take away from this video conference is that uh, essentially hate speech, uh, one of the main root causes of hate speech is um, having a scapegoat for certain issues. And I think one of the big, one, of, one solution to this is to uh, recognize that uh, we have to recognize our own faults and Personally, I think the best way to do so is to uh, engage in open dialogue with um, people of varying cultures and uh, backgrounds to be able to open up our uh, new, new perspectives of, uh, so that we may uh, increase our tolerance for things like these. Um, thank you. Excellent job, everyone. A lot of information today. I hope you're able to talk within your classes here after the video conference or on the online community to continue the dialogue uh, using that medium as well. A very special thanks to Sanjay for his help behind the scenes. And of course, thank you so much to our guest speaker, Mohammed, for all of the work that he does and for bringing his enthusiasm today to today's video conference as well as his insight. I do hope that you're all able to rise to his challenge to you that he gave at the end. As we do with all of our video conferences, we ask that you unmute your microphone one last time and say goodbye to one another. One another. Thanks for watching. Bye. 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 Bye.